Hi, welcome back to the New Sphere Podcast. My name is Shrek. Today we're off to Brazil, Rio specifically, to chat with a super cool dude. His name is Francisco Lafredi. Uh, this guy has been like a television personality. He's been a mad competitive Spiro since the late 80s. Um, he's a He's got a refined sense of ethics and uh, very interesting insights into sort of his journey, where he started, where he's come from and where he is now. He's gone from you know, commercially spearfishing to a completely different and changed mindset. Really, really enjoyed chatting with him. Uh, conversation just flowed brilliantly right until nearly the end where, as usual, something went wrong with the internet. But uh, we, we made it through and it was a quality conversation. I hope you guys really enjoy it. Francisco Lafredo, Lafredi, give him, give him a follow. This guy's a gentleman. He's uh, very cool. So we're going to get into that. Two shakes of a lamb star. Before we get there, Couple of quick shout outs, some really cool news. Um, new retailer has come on board in New Zealand, Typer Tackle in Northland, New Zealand, and now stocking 99 Spiro recipes. It's the only spearfishing store in the country that currently has 99 Spiro recipes on their shelf. It's not up on typertackle.com just yet, but check them out on uh, Instagram, Facebook, Typer Tackle. These legends have uh, committed to putting 99 Spiro recipes on the shelves and helping to make Kiwis become more intentional uh, stewards of the ocean, better cooks. Because um, i tell you what, there's already a hell of a lot of good Spiro cooks in the NZ. There's a whole bunch of wicked uh, Spiro recipes from New Zealand in the book. But just no spearfishing retailers, apart from Typer Tackle in Northland, are uh, stocking it as yet. But hey, thanks to, for Jared for hooking that up. Uh, you're the man, brother. I really appreciate you. Um, guys like him make spearfishing and our community what it is uh talking about legends though samuel phyllis he he played a huge part in the book uh in the 99 spirit recipes book he helped with proofreading editing and the awesome fish glossary section at the back so one of the cool features of the book is that uh basically wherever you are in the world you can go to the back and find out a road map of some similar species that may be in your part of the world even if the specific recipe that you want to cook was you know even if it come from the other side of the world you should still be able to hopefully replicate it wherever you are but anyway sam wrote me a cool email he said um now that some of the initial hype has worn off i just wanted to shout you shoot you a message and congratulate you on a monumental and awesome thing you've achieved with 99 spare recipes it's a massive credit to you as a person and also the spearfishing community broadly it was incredible to be part of something so genuine, authentic, and which brought so many people together in such a positive way. And I want to thank you for all your insatiable efforts and hard work. Thanks for letting me be a part of something so rich and rewarding. It's been incredible watching the impact it's having, and I hope it was everything you wanted it to be and more. Uh, it's a personal email, but um, really lovely one. And uh, I tell you what, he goes on to say, spearfishing in the community thereof is something else, man. So many other sports are plagued with competitiveness and toxicity, and I've, and I've never encountered that here. Spearfishing is a family full of friends and support and encouragement and healthy competition. It's a beautiful thing to be part of, and you and the Noob Spear have been a huge part of my journey into this world. I wanted to thank you for that. You've done a lot for, uh, a lot for me personally. So super kind words. I, I don't know what to say. Um, thanks, Sam. If you haven't got a copy of 99 Spear Recipes, seriously, it's a book made by our spearfishing community for our spearfishing community to help make us all more intentional stewards of the resource and uh, just become better cooks. Get outside those two to three sort of comfort recipes that you know. They're probably good recipes, but you, you, know, you slam over and over. Get out of your comfort zone and make something awesome um 99 spare recipes is available on noobspear.com it's available in a bunch of awesome retailers in australia spearfishing superstore spear west boss outdoor marimbula uh fergo's tackle world in wollongong they just ordered another box it's flying off their shelves uh batavia coast dive and water sports um check that out in geraldton and i've got adreno aspley in brisbane north adreno woolam gabba brisbane south adreno gold coast adreno melbourne adreno sydney and adreno perth and just on board type of tackle in New Zealand. So I'm loving this progress with the book. Um, before we get into, again, this ep awesome episode with uh, uh, Francisco, have a listen to this quick voice message from Bren Prousey, Ben Prousey over in WA. He's a legend. Here we go. Hey, Shrek. Ben here from Southwestern Australia. Uh, yeah, keen Spiro surfer. First up, love the podcast. You've totally filled a gap in the spearing world, mate. So kudos for that. Yeah, I'm 
binging my way through the episodes, listening to a few episodes, debating the sustainability, yeah, that flogged horse of fishing and ocean gathering in general. Really wanted to comment on that angle as I've not heard much mention of the fact that fishing in general isn't a farmed practice, obviously apart from the polluting fish farms and all that crap. It's not like fertilising a paddock to grow cattle, which becomes states conveniently wrapped in cling film. We all need to see this resource as a luxury food item, and I love the way you incorporate respecting the resource into the podcast with your awesome recipes and correct techniques of caring for the catch. So, yeah, we have a demersal band nearby that only affects recreational fishing and not commercial, and that's something else I can't get my head around. Personally, I don't feel a society can survive long-term if it puts a dollar value on a finite resource. You're doing an awesome job, mate. Keeping uh, keeping everyone stoked. Keep it actionable, mate. And uh, yeah, I'm off to the beach. Cheers. You. Hey guys, I hope you, um, you you enjoyed listening to what Ben had to say there. If you ever want to leave me a voice message, go to noobspero.com, head up into the menu, and leave me a voice message under the Nooba Story section. I'd love to hear about your take on one of the topics we discuss in the podcast, a scary story from you, what you learned from it, whatever you like. Go to Nooba Stories at noobspero.com and chuck it in there. Anyway, let's get into this awesome episode. Francisco Lafredi, here we go. I can't wait to get into today's episode, brought to you with proud partner, adreno.com.au. The Noob Spirit Podcast has been partnering with adreno.com.au for more than 100 episodes, and these guys are awesome. They have uh, huge spearfishing mega stores all over the country. You can shop online or in store. Use the code Noob Spiro whenever you spend more than $200, and you will automatically save $20. That's right, use the code Noob Spiro online or in store when you spend more than $200 and save 20 bucks. I love these guys. I remember the first time I brought a spear gun at adreno.com.au down at the Wool and Gabba store, and Adreno have been a huge part of the excitement that I have about spearfishing. Check them out at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpero to save. Neptonics was founded in 1996, making trigger mechs in a barn in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Solid gear that works was their founding principle and it still rings true today in every pull of a Neptonics trigger, in every snap of a Neptonics band, and in every whiz of a Neptonics spear gun reel, singing with the power of another big fish. Got a great deal, you can use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off anything and everything at Neptonics.com. It's solid gear that works, equipment you can rely on. Save 10% off any order at Neptonics.com when you use the code NOOB10. When you're starting to spearfish, there are a number of obstacles, and some of them are financial. Doing a freediving course is something that I've always recommended on this podcast. If you can do a freediving course with a Spiro, even better. But some of us can't even afford that. I've got good news for you. Today, you can do a freediving safety course for free at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. This course is brought to you by Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. He's got a passion for helping Spiros to die safer, smarter, and have more fun as well. This freediving safety course is practical and it's free. Check it out at freedivingsafety.com or go to noobspiro.com forward slash Ted and you'll find it there as well. Again, it's a free course just teaching you the basics of freedive spearfishing safety. Check it out, noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. G'day, noobers. I'm joined from the other side of the world by... By an absolute legend, a gentleman, very well regarded guy in uh, the world of spearfishing. He's been recommended to me before by uh, Jim Chiefy Mathy. Um, Francisco Lafredi joins me from Brazil, and uh, he's he actually has his own spearfishing podcast. He's a he's a mad competitive spearo. He's got records, and he's been on various teams and done all sorts of stuff in the sport. It's uh, awesome to have you on on uh, Francisco. Well, I'm very happy and honored to be here. I'm a fan of your podcast. I listen to all the episodes, well, so I'm I'm excited. <laughs> Thanks I was for having me. I was wondering who the other person was, eh? Because like you know, obviously my mum listens to everyone, and you're the other one, so that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's yeah. great, mate. Um, I I um have been doing my sort of my research around online, and uh, the, you, you seem to have um gathered a bit of a fan base of people that that, that like you and your your, your person you know your personality and the way you sort of do things in the world of spearfishing you, you've you've been all around the planet by the sounds of it yeah pretty much i've been uh, spearfishing since always i'm 50 years old and uh my first competition was 1989 
So <laughs> I've been around. Wow. I got lucky. I shot the biggest fish of the, this competition. So I got a, a good sponsor right off the bat and started traveling and competing. And I'm still obsessed about it. So, yeah. So tell me about. Tell me about Rio. So, you, like, I, I remember reading in your bio, was, I think on the Cressy site, because you, you you've had a lot to do with Cressy for a long time. Um, it it yep. says there that you really sort of started, you know, like maybe not spearfishing, but your your love for it or the appeal for it started when you were like five or something. Is that right? That's correct. Rio is – there's a huge spearfishing community and uh, ocean water uh, culture. So the oldest recollection I have is actually free diving with my father. Yeah, cool. Which was not a spear, but he was an avid uh, free diver snorkeler. So I was brought up in the water. I love eating fish. So mm. it was it was just a quick jump uh, to spear fishing. To talk about Rio, Rio is really a unique unique place for spear fishing. Mm. We are right in the border between a subtropical and a tropical ocean. So depending how the current goes. We get subtropical fish. We have, for example, the yellowtail that uh, you have abundant in Australia. Yeah. But we also have the same grouper from the Mediterranean. Wow. I mean, it's two fish that only meet here. And we also have the black grouper from the Caribbean. Wow. All meeting here, plus the amberjack. So it's it's really, we got the best of both oceans, uh, which is, and, the, and it produces an amazing fish. Mm. If you look down, uh, if you do some research, you see that the biggest fish, of each species, if the records not current records not from Rio region, it's the past record is from here. Like wow. the biggest king mackerels are from here, the biggest black groupers are from here, the biggest uh, Mediterranean groupers are from here. Not the biggest yellowtails because it's a slightly different species. We get yeah. the Cereola lalandi, yeah. but the biggest Cereola lalandis are from here. Yeah, so right. Your species are a different yellow. The biggest uh, mutton sampers are from here. The biggest cuberas are from here. Wow. And and that goes on. And it's a bunch of fish that never meet anywhere on the planet. Mm. And here you you can shoot them all. That said, there's a lot of spear fishing going on. So mm. it's it's fishy. They are these big fish. But they're really smart because they're being shot at since the early since the forties every single day. Yeah, cool. Oh, there's heaps of things I want to touch on there. Um, <laughs> one thing, like you know, you've got a video up and it talks about your philosophy around trophy spearfishing. And yeah. sometimes when you say the word trophy, a lot of people have this sort of negative perception of like, you know, some you know big game hunter going to Africa and you know, paying $100,000 to shoot the last black rhino or something like that, you know. I, I know it's not quite like that, but explain to me why you believe so much in this this brand of spearfishing and, and why you like to promote it to others. It's my, my background is commercial spearfishing. So I started shooting fish and selling fish and, and paying my bills, which I did for half of my life. And it's, now I advocate against it. I think spearfishing should only be a sport. Hmm. So. When you're a commercial fisherman, it's all about how much fish you catch, quantity. And when I became a trophy spear fisherman, I started looking for cool fish, fish that challenge me, that are hard to catch, good to eat. And uh, so it's it's that trade-off. If you're not looking for quantity or just putting food on the plate, you're looking for that one special fish. And in that video, I, I showcased uh, two things. First is how to catch a trophy fish, which, which means, like I said in a video, many times you go home empty-handed, mm -hmm. even though you're surrounded by amazing fish. And that video, I'm surrounded by a giant school of 20, 25-kilo striped bass, mm -hmm. and I don't take the shot. And then at the end of the day, this the monster shows up. Mm -hmm. And then I, I pull the trigger. And and if you I don't know if you notice this, but that, in my opinion, is the most incredible shot at least that I have on camera, mm. because it, it was super precise and it was from the hip. Yeah, it was right. a cowboy shot. <laughs> if, if I had stretched my arm to do this, everybody would be gone. So I was like, Bing! you know. Oh wow. So, and and that's I mean I don't know for part in uh, we're not at the tips for beginners yet, but mm. these these uh, wrist shots and hip shots and crazy shots is something that I practice a lot. Because when the opportunity comes, I'm I'm prepared and I can land these shots. We'll talk about it. Let's talk about it. So, ha, what? How do you how do you teach people to make um you know unconventional shots? Well, I have a video called uh, 
It's uh, uh, Cressy came out with the Geronimo, Geronimo Elite Test. It's it's just a video I'm showcasing a uh, Cressy's new gun. So uh, I go out in Rio in a day that the water's kind of murky, mm. and there was these baby barracudas that we have here. They don't grow, and little jacks and and uh, small fish just swimming fast around. Mm. And I just start shooting them. And in this video, I I do wrist shots, I do hip shots. So I like I enjoy going out. And making a stringer of these mm. one kilo fish, 800 grams fish, mm. and you get a good target practice. Mm. So, you know, and that's the most useful thing for shooting big fish. Uh, in competitions, I've excelled as a big fish uh, trophy winner. Mm. I have much more big fish trophies than uh, first place trophies. And uh, one of the reasons is because I'm, I have very precise shooting. So I can spearfish with a small gun, l land headshots, and bring the fish home. Mm. Today is everybody with these huge guns, with a bunch of slings, landing belly shots from far away. Yeah. And it's really kind of sloppy spearfishing. And you hurt and damage a lot of fish. Mm. You know, so if you you have a small, agile gun, you can land he headshots, mm. and you'll bring the big fish home. And in the... Blue Water World Cup, which is the tournament that lands the biggest fish yeah. in, in the planet. I've won the big fish tr trophy three times. And always with the Eurogun, uh, two slings, competing everybody with the bazookas. But <laughs> I'm not giving belly shots. I'm giving solid headshots. I shot a big marlin. I shot big amberjack. I shot a bunch of fish. It's thanks to all this going out and, and whacking all these fast-moving small fish. Headshots, like with a 110, like 120, you know, conventional sort of rail gun with, a, you know, like two bands, I'm guessing sort of like a 16-mil yeah. six, 16 bands or 14 mil bands? Uh, 16, you know? 16. Okay. Two 16s. <clears throat> when you're hitting a fish in the head, like particularly a large fish, um, all that skull structure sometimes, like, do you ever have issues with penetration, like getting through into there? Yes. Yep. Yes. But, I mean, you got to get closer to the fish. But if you have a small, agile gut, you can get closer. And it's it's important to know the anatomy of the fish. I did this in, I did this in the past, and I recommend shoot a big uh, uh, pelagic fish or bottom fish, bury the head, let the ants eat all the flesh, and study the skull. Mm. The skull is, is solid in the front. But not only soft through the back, but it has tunnels yeah. that actually direct your spear towards towards the brain. Mm. It's like Star Wars, you know, when the when they are the, the Death Star <laughs> and they shoot. The, it's kind of like that. Yeah, yeah, I remember. So, yeah. so uh, just for the analogy for for maybe the younger generation, like Luke's coming in and he's got to drop a drop his payload in a very small target on the Death Star, and then so this is kind of your analogy. So. Trying to find that those those channels into the fish's brain, you know, with your with your smaller diameter shaft from a smaller spear gun. It's uh, yeah, okay, that's cool. I like the analogy too. Yeah, you shoot you shoot the soft spot, soft soft spot spot, mm. and and my technique and use over and over again. The the big the marlin I shot at the Blue Water World Cup was like this. I shot a giant thirty five kilo king mackerel. With a small 110 on the real gun uh, recently, big amberjacks, uh, big uh, pelagic fish. I always let them pass mm. and I shoot them from behind. Yeah. They've all been killed like this. So if, you, see, if you saw the marlin quartering and, away, and people get to quartering sorry? away, they're quartering away from you and then you're looking for an angle into their head. Yeah, I let them pass. I let them pass. And, and, and this is the shot I want. Mm. Not this, not this. But like this, yeah. if, if you have a bazooka, yeah. okay, you can do that. But I don't have the bazooka. And I prefer not to. It, it pays off at the end. So you let the fish pass and give this shot. Mm. It's better because you, you can penetrate the head, but also two other benefits. If you give a perpendicular shot, when Morning. the fish swims away, yep. your spear is going to wiggle. So mm. you're going to tear the fish and bent the spear. If you shoot like this, you're not going to tear it and you're not going to ruin your spear. Mm. Which, I mean, it's not saving spear, but sometimes you're in a boat, you're some remote place, you need your shaft. Mm. The year I won the, the the three prizes at the Blue Water World Cup, I used one single spear for all seven big big fish that I shot, including the Marlin. Marlin. None of them uh, ruined, uh, ruined the spear. Yeah. Because right. they're all 
So like what Francisco is talking about is you, you don't shoot a fish directly side on to it, like 90 degree sort of shot into their head. You're looking for that sort of, would you say what, 30 to sort of 60 degree angle? Uh, 45, yeah, 45. Okay. Um, do you, approximately. Do you ever, have, and I've had this happen to me, it sounds like you're far more precise a shot than I am. Um, have you ever had your spear glance off their head? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, Instagram is only the highlight reel, right? There's <laughs> less glorious moments. <laughs> but once I actually landed a headshot, yep. and uh, the, the it was kind of blood in my spear, yep. and I said, how, how does this grouper get away? But So I, it took me like 20 minutes to dive into the hole again. It was a 21 kilo grouper, if I'm not mistaken. Wow. And I found the grouper passed out. It was just <laughs> knocked right here and yeah. it, it just passed out. So that way it was a, a glass with a happy end. But in, uh, I don't know, 30 plus years of spearfishing, that only happened once. So don't <laughs> don't count on it. Have you looked at the head structure of a, of a big groper? Like they, they, they just seem to yeah. have so yeah. much more um, cartilage and hard stuff to get through in their heads than other fish. Yeah, the the Kubera and the groupers have the toughest head, mm. and uh, this shot here, like with with my spear with the the unicorn seven seven mil, yeah, it, it won't have penetration if I'm if if I'm not close by. Yeah. So I uh, lesson for if you want to shoot big fish, never try a miracle shot. Mm. Miracle shots don't land big fish. You're gonna hurt the fish. You're gonna waste your time, and you're gonna lose an opportunity because many times the fish come back. Mm. So. You know, if there's a big grouper facing me, I get really close while I look for, you know, my shot from behind, which also works for groupers. It's not yeah. only for pelagic fish. I was going to ask you about that. So, like, with, with grouper species, a lot of the time they're coming out of their structure and it's like a defense mechanism and they they quite often come to us head first. So that uni unicorn shot that we're talking about is yeah. pretty common with those particular species. Um, and then sometimes waiting for them to turn – they do it in like such a quick motion. It's very hard to get that ideal shot. I mean, have you got any techniques for that? Well, the pelagic, I let them pass and do the shot. Mm. If a grouper gives me a headshot, I'll give, I'll take the headshot. Ah, yeah. Okay. I'll take the headshot. I, I won't wait for it to turn around. If it turns and then, you know, fish go like that. So it's, in, it's important to have your shot walk, the fish walk into your shot. Yeah. So especially with macros that uh, in your side of the world are, mm. are, present a lot it's a fish it's one of the few fish you can actually dive and chase mm. you can dive and, and swim after a mackerel they won't yeah. i i can't recall of any other fish but that shot from behind you have to calculate when it walks into your shot a lot yeah. of you see on videos people shooting the fish is going like this even if you land it it's not as penetrating yeah so any fish that's not facing you i try to work on this and if you see the uh, I'm trying to work on this, and I'm making gestures here. And yeah, and, yeah, uh, it's okay. It'll be, it'll be. Maybe you can explain it better. Yeah, but. yeah. So yeah. what what Francisco is talking about is like um, some fish in the Spanish mackerel, the scombrous sort of the mackerel species. They they will sort of swim side to side, um, and if you're swimming directly behind them, they continue to keep turning so that they can see you. And um, you can exploit that by actually swimming on an angle to make sure that you're always in their blind spot, and then eventually they turn broadside to you. And uh, that's when you can get a shot opportunity. I remember reading about that technique in this old little blue black and white book called uh, The Len Jones Guide to Spearfishing. And I, I, oh, I looked cool. at the picture. I understood the concept almost immediately. And I remember the first time I pulled it off, I was like, this is the freaking one of the coolest things ever. <laughs> and uh, it's so cool when you, you know, when people hand on that knowledge and, and that's exactly what you're doing. So, yeah, it's it's uh, it's awesome. They're, they're a really fun fish because, like you say, you're in midwater – you can just follow behind and then you try and make sure you're always in their blind spot and uh, then they turn and give you a shot. It's cool. Yeah, one of my favorite fish for sure. I love eating them too. For sure. It's not highly appreciated in some parts. Yeah. But, buddy, you're just cooking it rock. Yeah. You know, the, yeah. the, the Japan. A oh. lot of people marinate the mm. mackerel, the, especially Asians in a Japanese restaurant. It's called the Saba, S-A-B-A. Okay. It's usually marinated, but I do it with uh, garlic and nira. Okay. And uh, it, it works well. Mm. I, lo I love eating mackerels. <laughs> I want to talk about some Brazilian seafood. I know you've been on like a couple of TV shows, cooking stuff, even though you're not a formally trained chef. You're what I like to term, you know, like a, you know, a Spiro chef. I, I, no offense to Jai Gibbons, who's actually a chef and he's a Spiro. And so he's the Spiro <laughs> chef. 
But like, I think like guys that have taken their their cooking skills to another level with fish is showing a deep appreciation for it, and I really appreciate it. I want to get into that with you before before we were chatting. Like um, around Rio, you were talking about the convergence of sort of these subtropical species and the temperate water species, and you guys are getting this really awesome nutrient rich water which seems to lead to having large members of every sort of ideal species i was going to ask you what the prevailing currents are there are, we basically have a, a south uh, it's east and a west current mm. so any time of the year we can have any of them so i can't tell you all oh, come in whatever month and it's going to be really good and whatever month is going to be really bad so any time of the year when we get a south current mm. and then South current brings the warm water and clear water, but eventually a rough sea. Mm. So before the sea gets really rough, those are the best days. And when this rough sea ends and the first day of the water coming back from the east, mm. and then those are the best spearfishing days. The east current uh, brings cold water and murky. Mm. So in, in, in 72 hours, I can go from uh, Caribbean to South New Zealand. <laughs> so again, it makes... And makes uh, maybe not South New Zealand, but California. Yeah. So it uh, it's good for us spiro. So we get a chance to practice uh, different kinds of spear fishing. We do a lot of huntings in caves with flashlight, uh-huh. but we don't get a lot of blue water b- below thirty feet, thirty meters. Okay. So uh, we're not super free divers, Mm-mm. and on the average, the Brazilians don't spear deeper than uh, thirty meters. That. Yeah, sometimes I look at the people that spear below those depths um, consistently. That like it just it. I think you have to have a specific personality, temperament, physiology, and then and the ability to dive those depths quite regularly to be able to sustain that kind of diving. And I, I don't think it's that common to maybe ninety percent of spearos anyway. So yeah. But you've been competitive on the world stage as well. Um, a lot of the tournaments these days, particularly in the med, seem to be super deep comps. How do you, how how do you go faring in those? Like, um, well, I kind of I, it's it's tough for me because mm. I'm not a deep guy, a deep diver. You know, thirty meters is deep for me. At least on Facebook, thirty meters is shallow nowadays. So <laughs> it always, well, I always think it always social, I think social media and 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 YouTube have given us and many spiros such a distorted perception of depth. Like when you say thirty Perfect. meters is deep for me, I'm thinking thirty meters is deep for you know for mo- like like ninety nine percent of spiros. I think. Yeah, not not on Facebook, yeah. but <laughs> our sport is shooting fish. Yeah, it's not diving deep, mm. and. Uh, People get it all wrong. Everybody's obsessed with going deep, and they think the deeper I dive and the biggest uh, breath hold I have will be proportional to my fish. You know, uh, how fast uh, did uh, Michael Jordan run? <laughs> Who cares? This sport is uh, putting the ball on the, on the net. Yeah, yeah. Our, our sport is whacking fish, blood on deck. Mm. So it's really not about how deep you dive. And because of this, people are obsessed with spear fishing at their limit and that just ruins their hunting ability so let's say if i can dive i don't know 30 meters probably my optimal diving uh, uh depth to perform is something like 20 meters anything deeper than that i'm i'm too close to my limit and i don't have enough time relaxation so to perform at my best mm. so i prefer to dive at 5 10 meters well, strong, take my time, then be pushing in my limit and and not performing. So I've competed in in the Mediterranean, actually at the World Championship, and I was by far the lamest free diver in the competition. But I I brought the brought home the big fish trophy. Yeah, wow. you know, from all these guys. So I tease them. I say, like, you know, it, uh, deep diving is for those that can't shoot fish in the shallow. If you can shoot <laughs> fish in the shallow, why bother going deep? Of course, uh, well, that said, it was uh, 30 meters, probably the last time I dove 30 meters. Mm-mm. But but there are fish in the shallow, even in the Mediterranean. I just got back from uh, Palma de Mallorca, which is the world capital of the spearfishing ch- champions. And everybody in the podium uh, was shooting fish below 40 meters. Wow. I didn't do well, but in, I studied all the results from this, this competition. And then in then 20 years, there's one one Greek guy that won the competition and beat all the deep divers. 
spearfishing at 10, 15 meters. Wow. So it, it can be done. And if you can't dive 40 meters, go to the shallow, perform in the shallow, and uh, you might score. You know, yeah. a guy that can hunt well and can shoot fish with a snorkel in his mouth, just floating. He'll do much better than some other guy that's trying to go to his maximum depth and and neglects. Mm. In history, there's only been one guy that has been world record free diver and world champion spear fisherman. Just to say that these are two different sports, you know. Yeah. So focus on your hunting and gradually you will improve your free dive. But mm. don't overthink it. I, I look at some of the, the deeper stuff too, and I think, okay, yeah, cool. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna let's say I'm diving to 45 meters, right? It, that that dive time is probably two and a half minutes. Let's just say, you know, therefore my recovery time is like probably needs to be around seven minutes. I've just spent ten more. minutes <laughs> on one dive. Yeah, more, more. And but that's what they do. They go out on a competition. Yeah. The guy pra- in the world championship, the guy gives ten dives. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. He has ten dives, and if he does eleven, you'll have uh, decompression sickness and and be screwed. And that's that's the other thing is decompression sickness. So like in a four or six hour swim comp, you know, do I want to dive ten times or or do I want to do some hunting and and do thirty dives? You know, like I look at it and I just think, uh, and like it is fun sometimes doing deep dives, particularly when you're in a really good team and you've got some awesome people around you and like it can be cool to see what you're capable of and you know there's something special about it but i i don't know that 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 is spearfishing for most of us most of the time no it's not it's for super free divers and like you said not only they have a an amazing body kind of built for that not only big lungs but a tolerance to to decompression uh, sickness and yeah. it, it's beautiful i i wish i could do it I I was I mean you're in a competition you got to do what you got to do to win. Yeah, if the yeah. fish in the bottom and you can dive deep. And this competition it was amazing. I I hanged out with uh, my Italian friend uh, Gabriele Del Bene. Mm. He has a world record. He shot a fish like at 68 meters or something. <laughs> and this year he's going to shoot a fish at 75. Wow. Beautiful. I wish I could could that could do that, but I can't. So I'll I'll stick to the shallow. So he was he was in the world championship that I shot the biggest fish. So <laughs> everybody dove deeper than me and I brought home the trophy. Just to say, it's not only about diving deep, but you're in a competition and you know the fish are deep. Good for you if you can make it. Uh, I'm I'm their fan. You know, I applaud them. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Um, Truly amazing. Hun- hunting too in the shallows can be particularly hard as well because, you know, as I understand it in the mid, sometimes there's this, there's this zone where there's not a lot going on and, a lot of the fish are in like two meters of water in the whitewash in the in the in the sort of the churn. You get the bait fish and the smaller fish congregating in these areas, and then there's the stuff that's in the real deep. And there's kind of these those these two sweet spots. Is that? Um, but hunting in two meters, you know, like it can be really challenging. Anything in under five meters because every noise you make from the surface spooks everything underneath you. And I know that from hunting with new guys, where you are sort of hunting those depths. No, that's correct. That's correct. And and fish in the shallow get bugged by divers more often. So uh, super deep, these these big groupers are are dumb. Yeah, they're not as smart as the the groupers in the shallow. So it it does in a way demand more technique, mm. and also a competition. Okay, it's a five hour competition. On the average, I do a minute, minute 10, 20 second dive. But my recovery time is a minute. Mm. So in a five-hour competition, I stay I stay more than half of the time underwater. <laughs> Just statistically, that improves my chance of beating some guy that's diving all day at 30 meters and take five, five minutes, six minute recovery dives. Mm. You know? Mm. So you can excel in competitions diving shallow. Love it. I did uh, reasonably well at the Coffs Harbor and you know. Nobody can beat Dwayne Herbert, okay? He's a phenom. <laughs> really a true phenom. Yeah. But, and I don't, just say that I didn't need, need to dive deep uh, to do well in the comp. What did you think of Coffs Harbor diving? Do you like the, uh, I, I found the benthos there, like the, the structure and the life and the what they've got going on. It's, it's quite varied, but some of it's just such beautiful diving. I loved it. I loved it. I want to go back. Uh, they need to... Well, who am I to tell them what they should do? Yeah. It's the oldest running uh, Blue Water World Tournament, uh, World uh, Competition in the world. 
So obviously they're doing it right. It's just this new rule with the honor system and taking fish home at night. I've seen uh, I've seen enough stuff going around that I don't want to travel the world and I don't know. It's it's maybe bad for me to say put, casting doubts on people. Yeah. But if you have a big competition year after year, eventually some wise guy is going to show up. Yeah. So I prefer the old rules. The people pe- people cheating, and I've heard about some various nefarious practices. It's not just putting <laughs> lead sinkers down fishes' mouths. It's uh, taking fish that you may have speared a few days before and then claiming that you shot them on the competition day. I don't know what sort I've of seen. person you would have to be to do that, but I know that people were just super competitive and it brings out some of the worst in people. Yeah, that has happened more than once. But, I mean, there are all levels of cheating. People put rocks in the belly at world tournaments with a thousand people watching. Uh, they're opening up open up, open up uh, bellies of groupers to see if there's there's rocks inside. Mm. That has happened before at, at the world stage. Wow. But people drag buoys, uh, uh, accelerate their engines, scare other people's fish. I mean, oh, wow. that's why I'm also kind of against uh, money prizes, because if there are money prizes, chances uh, people will cheat more. I just love a functional and simple spear gun that I can trust when I pull the trigger. Killshot Spear Guns utilize the finest of kiln-dried Burmese teak. Killshot Spear Guns also combine American-made parts and fine craftsmanship to bring you accurate, reliable, and simple spear guns that you can trust fish after fish. Get $30 off any Killshot Spear Gun at KillshotSpearGuns.com. Yes and amen, Uber. That's $30 off American-made performance spear guns at killshotspearguns.com. I'm really sorry for this terrible accent. Brought to you by Ed Martin at killshotspearguns.com. Function first, pretty design second. Penetrator's dual action water channeling rail provides more efficient action and similar fins by directing more water flow down the blade. This eliminates wobble, meaning that you get way more bang for your buck, for your energy buck. Visit penetratorfins.com Use the code NoobSpiro to save $25 on every pair, on any pair. That's correct, my friend. Use the code NoobSpiro to save $25 on any set of Penetrator blades at Penetrator.com. In the world of freedive spearfishing, there's no magic breathing technique that's all of a sudden going to get you down and shoot massive fish at depth and holding big bottom times. But there is a way to do it safer and smarter, take down more fuel to maximise the time that you have there. Learn at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted with Ted Hardy from Immersion Freediving. If you take down more fuel, you can stay for longer. Learning to take a bigger breath is not such a big deal. Ted breaks it down for you with a free online course at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. Take down 20 to 30% more air just by learning how to take a full breath. Again, learn how to do it free at noobspiro.com forward slash Ted. Great news guys, Adam Stern has made his freedivingfamily.com courses available at a discount for the Noob Spiro community. If you get on freedivingfamily.com, use the code SPIRO, you'll get 20% off any course. There's a bunch of sick courses on there. There's an equalizing uh, stage one, there's an equalizing advanced techniques um, video there. They're two of my absolute favorites. If you have any problems with equalizing, go to freedivingfamily.com. Get Adam's course and use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course. Check it out at freedivingfamily.com. Ah, ah, my, my son just showed up. <laughs> That's all good. That's ah, all good. Bring him in. Hello, money young shot, fella. Money shot. Money shot. That's a- <laughs> <laughs> what? No, no. Sorry. <laughs> That's Francisco Spiro of the future. He's holding up there, so. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Kids are a delight. Um, has he been in the water already, Francisco? Yes, and he talks about big, big fish, walks around in, here in the apartment with, with fins and masks on, changed my fishing. Now now I do really cautious. I don't dive deep anymore. Yeah. I'm always with the dive flag, and it, it changes everything. Mm. It changes everything. Now that you, you've, you've traveled a lot of different places and you've observed a lot of the different sort of subcultures because spearfishing mm. there's very there's peculiarities among spiros 
in very specific parts of the world, it seems like a lot of Spiros, there are a group of Spiros that travel, but in certain areas, they have very specific cultural ideas about, you know, how they do their spearfishing. In Rio, what what's what sort of some of the the main factors you see in the spearfishing culture there? What do you like and, and what do you want to see improvement in? Well, I like that people, in a way, venerate. Is that a word? Venerate? Yeah. Uh, honor old, and... Uh, old and high esteem, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Spear, spear fishermen here are, are heroes. Ah. You know, it's a popular sport. It used to be on the news a lot and covered by newspapers. And you get respect for being a good Spiro. It's it's part of the culture here in Rio. So that's great. Uh, the, the part I don't like, it's very focused on shooting fish for profit. Uh, and I've done it a, a ton, so oh, he's a hypocrite, whatever. Uh, I, ch- I changed my mind. Uh, if you're spearfishing for money, you will uh, shoot more than you should. You shoot smaller fish than you should. And at the end of the day, you don't enjoy spearfishing as much as you do on a recreational. Mm. So it's bad for yourself. You push yourself more. I've lost uh, plenty of commercial spear fishermen, uh, dead, died, uh, blacked out. So it just kind of ruins the sport. It's it's bad for the ocean. And uh, you can make a better living today talking about the fish you shoot than actually selling the fish you shoot. Mm. So that, uh, with the internet, internet completely changed the sport. It gave an audience mm. to an audience-less sport. And also it gave a tribune for us to defend ourselves from unfair criticism mm. for sure spearfishing would be forbidden all over the world if it wasn't for the internet yeah. and now we can we can defend our sport and it's easy to defend because we have the facts are on our side but we still have a culture of hiding it and i'm i'm the opposite i want to confront everybody you know i've had problem with uh sea shepherd which which i i can't talk about the global sea shepherd but here in brazil it's a t-shirt t-shirt yeah. company that uses uh, environmental BS to sell T-shirts, and they do stupid actions, and and they can't they can't defend. So uh, this is one time. Uh, so argument for you guys, you know. Uh, this one time, I uh, there was a marine a marine uh, park manager convention, so mm. an auditorium with two hundred marine park managers and assistant marine park managers, and of course they didn't and did not invite me uh, to speak on stage. But they they had a moment for the yacht club representative or something like that. So I got on stage, grabbed the <laughs> microphone, and said, uh, "You know, when I got on stage, half of the audience was grumpy already because the ones that knew me got, you know, grumpy looking at me. And then they poked the next guy and said, "Look, this is the guy that kills fish for a living." So talk about a hostile environment. <laughs> it was that, it was that audience. So I I grabbed the microphone. I didn't say I'm happy to be here. Or, Good afternoon. Nothing like that. I just said uh, off the bat, do you guys agree with me that all fish can be caught legally or illegally? And then the grumpy crowd nodded their head. They agreed with me. Do you guys agree with me that all fish can be caught sustainably or unsustainably? And they're like, so now please raise your hand. Who here? can say that they only eat fish caught legally and sustainably. And I raise my hand. And none of the tree huggers can say that because <laughs> they have no clue where their fish comes from. Mm. So who's the problem? And then I put the mic down and I left. <laughs> <laughs> there's no way. There's coherently, coherently, only a person that believes that humans should not eat fish from the ocean can legitimately coherently argue against spearfishing. Mm. If you accept that humans can eat fish from the ocean, you cannot you cannot uh, be against spearfishing mm. because it's by far the most sustainable. It's not the most sustainable. There's a catch to it. And yeah. people love to say, oh, spearfishing, it's the most sustainable. It's the most selective. Mm. But being selective is not necessarily good. Mm. If I'm only targeting baby groupers, I'm being super selective. Mm but I'm not being sustainable. Mm. So, so spearfishing is as sustainable as a person pulling the trigger. Yeah. It gives the spear fishermen an, uh, an opportunity to do the most sustainable fishing in the planet. Mm. But you have to want to exercise this uh, selectiveness. I like what you did there. You you, you you got the audience to engage with, with some of the core ideas and you did it very quickly. 
um, and, and you and you and you got you got engagement. Like you, you had a representation, so everyone was able to connect with the ideas you were purveying. There, there are there are a, a portion of these people, and Sea Shepherd are one of them. And don't don't don't. I'm not denigrating them completely. Like they've done some awesome stuff in our in our world. You know, like some of them have got massive hearts, and they they want to help the environment. They want to help whales and stuff like this. And some of the their causes are really honourable, and they've done some good work. But one of their core values is that there should be no fishing, none. They do not believe that any form of taking fish is sustainable and humans should have nothing to do with the oceans pretty much. We should barely be allowed to even travel across them and observe stuff, let alone catch fish in them. Um, they're, they're completely anti-fishing. And a lot of these environmentalists, they live in an ivory tower where they think that um, the, the less fishing, the better. And they they completely denigrate all forms of fishing. I, I connect with your idea and I think like, you know, we are 100% sustainable if we make the right choices because we are 100% selective. There's zero bycatch and we, we can do the right thing. And I like seeing people connect with the natural environment and I, I think you've got the same thing. It's like there's nothing cooler than taking something out of the ocean and preparing it for your family and putting it in front of them. You can tell them everything about it. And when you start to learn about, you know, the ecosystem, the species you're taking, the impact they have when they're taken or removed – like it, it, it makes you a conservationist, which is why I can understand at 50 years old, your ideas are completely different than they were from when you were 27 years old. Um, you've gone on a journey. And well put, and it, it's true. You know, we live today in a world of a conflict between what sounds good and what actually is good, facts against narrative. And this, oh, we shouldn't eat fish from the ocean. Not only it's, it's not, um, how do you say, viable, you will have mass starvation, mm. but it harms us. It really harms us. And now I'll, I'll show you how. And I had this uh, debate on stage with Sylvia Earle. So, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So she was on, on the stage and she said, uh, basically, we shouldn't eat, humans shouldn't eat fish from the ocean. She, she's my hero. Okay. I love her. Yeah. And, uh, and how can somebody shoot a grouper? And then I go on stage and said, oh, I bought my car and my boat shooting groupers, you know? Yeah. So, but I said, look, first, it's not viable. We humans need the protein from the ocean. So say wishing, oh, the world, we're, the way to save the ocean is stop eating fish. It's not going to happen. Let, let's find something that maybe doesn't sound as good, but is realistic. Okay. And second, every single, every single marine protect no fishing zone every no fishing zone which no fishing zone oh how beautiful every no fishing zone is an illegal fishing paradise mm. every no fishing zone get constantly raped mm. by illegal fishermen the only thing that can stop and this is not a theory solitary islands in cough harbor but Seralvo in mexico and i have plenty of block island in, in new york the only way to stop illegal fishing is an intense activity of sport fishing. Ah. So the idea that, oh, we're going to have a closed zone that nobody's going to fish, that's going to happen. So you have two alternatives. You have, or you're going to have illegal fishing, or you're going to have regulated smart uh, sport fishing. And I, part of my, the way I, I make a living with spear fishing, I do guided trips. Mm. Something I started doing late, I do only for a few people. Uh, I, I'm worried about being responsible for people in the water. That's why I don't want to teach and give lessons, you know. But I do some guided strip and, and people hire me to shoot cool fish around the world. And it's kind of what a captain of, of a national spear fishing team does. We, we're dropped at some random place each year in the, in the world and we have to find the coolest fish. So in a way, I'm a cool cool fish specialist. And where do I find cool fish? Only two places in the planet have cool fish. Can you guess? First answer is, oh, protected areas. No, protected areas don't have cool fish. They have a bunch of pretty, small, colorful fish. But the nice, cool, expensive fish are gone. Whacked by illegal fishermen that go there January 1st. They go there on Christmas. They go at the Super Bowl game day. And they're going to find their way. Cool fish are in only two places in the planet. Some remote place that nobody goes. And these days, these, these spots are each day uh, less you and know, less. harder to find, mm -hmm. less and less. Or 
in a place where you have intense sport fishing, where people pay pay licenses that finance finance uh, surveillance. Business. Yep. Yeah, you have local business and you have an industry that thrives with these fish. Mm. So, you know, money talks, bullshit walks. So mm. if usually you get you make more money destroying the ocean. If you have intense sport fishing, you make more money preserving the ocean. Mm. So the money is going to be preserved by by the invisible hand of the market. So if you have intense uh, sport fishing, you have people paying licenses. You have people occupying these spots and scaring or making illegal fishing unviable. Uh, scuba people go at a set time, at a set day, and it's they're easy to avoid. But sport fishermen will go when it's cold, when it's rainy, when there's a Super Bowl, when it's <laughs> January 1st and they didn't do celebrate New Year's Eve so they can fish alone. So they are going to be there when the illegal, spear, the illegal fishing is going to be there. And one more thing, sport fishing, at the end of the day, employs as guides the people that otherwise would be doing the illegal fishing. Yeah. So it's it's the magic formula, and it works. There are plenty of exa- examples across the world. So going back to the day, I, I made this argument in the stage with uh, Sylvia, uh, at, at, uh, with uh, uh, Doctor Earl. She left halfway, and then we had a break for lunch. Guess what they served for lunch Fish. at this big event? Groupers. Oh wow! You know. So let's stick to what's working, and not so much uh, the pretty speech, but the factual. I was listening to Joe Rogan the other day and he was talking about how there's a perception in terms of the value of certain creatures over others and how we have this this hierarchy in our mind. And he was talking about how bear, bear meat is, is extremely frowned upon. And yet, you know, it's back in the day, like in the early settler days in, in the US, um, you know, uh, settlers would prefer um, bear meat over venison because it tasted more like beef and there were other benefits to to it as well and uh but nowadays you know uh maybe it was too much yogi and boo boo and stuff but you know anthropomorphism has invaded our society and and um and skewed a lot of perceptions and you know uh, did you watch see spiracy to to, yeah. to see that yeah did, did that like um how did that make you feel and and how did, did it make you respond did you did you did you did you well two, two observations to what you said I think that whatever is closest to us is harder to kill, at least for me. Mm. So warm-blooded mammals, I would have a hard time killing. And also bigger fish. If a fish has an eyeball my size, yeah. it, it's closer to me, and I do feel sorry. But I, I want to eat the fish. You can't, you can't make an omelet without breaking the egg. Mm. So uh, I rationalize the kill, and, I'm, and I eat it, and I'm fine. But the bigger the fish or... A mammal, it's it's harder for me. Regarding sea spiracy, uh, there's they have a lot of pretty speech and let's not eat fish from the ocean, which is it's it's not only unpractical, it harms us, like I, I just showed. Mm. But it has one great, great super value, which is it shows how the regulating agencies and all those people that stamp and say, oh, this is safe tuna or this is selective fishing, whatever. It's all bullshit and they're all corrupt. So that's that's a big, big, uh, big insight for sea, sea spiracy. Mm. You know, if you want to eat sustainable tuna or catch it yourself or don't eat it, just because it has a stamp on it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. 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 That's actually good. I like that. You, you've taken some of the more positive points out of the film and and. And, you know, there are things we can take action on, you know, like um, if we don't listen to criticism and and some of the best points, then we're no better than anyone else. We're not really adapting and, and improving. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very interesting point. Um, I read in some of your notes, like you wrote the initial proposal for a Mo- Mona Kagaris, uh Rio's yeah. Marine Park, and you serve still on as a member of its board. T- tell me about the Mona Kagaris Marine Park. It's it's a beautiful island right off the beach in Rio, okay. and there's great spear fishing. It was the venue of World Championship. It's uh, a group of eight islands, uh, two kilometers, uh, three kilometers off the beach, and it's it's close to shore. It was being whacking a lot, a lot of commercial illegal spear fishing going on. So I wanted to preserve it. Uh, 
I could I reached out to the authorities, made a proposal. I had some important friends and uh, made it happen. So it's we're still working out. There's a lot of interest. There are a lot of uh, artisan fishermen that make a living fishing there. So okay. it's you know you got to look at everybody's side, but it needs to be preserved. It needs rules. It can't be whoever wants do does whatever they want and you know. It, it does, we know how that ends. So it's my backyard. I want it preserved. So I'm I'm engaged and I'm involved in that. So it's a marine park, but it is open to artisanal fishermen. fishermen. Yeah, the rule, the current rule, I want to change, but the current rule, you cannot anchor 30 meters. You cannot uh, approach a boat 30 meters from the island, and you cannot fish 10 meters from the island. Okay. So... It, this wasn't my idea, but it's a current rules. They're changing. So okay. there's some uh, limits. There's big fishing limits to it. But these are only one of one of uh, the four archipelagos in the city of Rio. Okay. So we're protecting one, but there's plenty there's of islands others. to everybody okay. to spearfish. So I think we should uh, we should have. I'm I'm in favor of these marine parks. Mm. What I'm trying to implement is make it a a, a sport fishing marine park that okay. would really protect it there's still like i said there's still illegal fishing going on because the rules limit the presence of of sport fishermen and that just open gives an opportunity for for illegal fishing so we made progress but there's still a long way to go yeah 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 it's an interesting one like i i think I, I I talk about this a lot, so you know, for people that listen to the podcast, they're probably thinking, "Oh, oh here it goes again." But uh, you know, like <laughs> I really dislike the importation of um, seafood from countries where there's not enough regulation, and I, I feel like in our country where fisheries are managed to a high level and it's improving every year, um, you know, we should be eating as local as we can, and I would love to see more legislation and if you are going to regulate um seafood and stuff i would like to see more rules around that why why aren't we eating no. locally caught stuff you know and a lot of the sentiment around seafood and fish like and we'll, we'll i want to start chatting with you about cooking it's like people's perception of fish is actually you know pretty skewed like the marketing for what seafood is sustainable in your area and what tastes good it's generally completely wrong, you know. Like people know, the average person on the street knows very little about what are the best locally fit, caught fish for eating and for sustainability and all the rest of it, and how they're caught. There's there's so little information about it. Like, in, in, to most people, I think the oceans are still like a, a, an alien place. They know very little about it, and I would like to see more of that if we are going to push. You're more no, you're absolutely right. People don't know what they're eating. They can't distinguish a snook from a grouper. You know, when they say, when they somebody says, "Oh, I love grouper," it's just some. It's a word they remember. They don't really know what the what a grouper is. And at the end of the day, most fish are good to eat. It's really about how fresh it is. If you can properly clean it, take a fillet or do whatever cut and cook it uh, right. So here, in, in, I'm a fish consultant for restaurants in Rio because okay. all the restaurants are slaves from the snook and uh, grouper that everybody asks. And these fish are super expensive, but there are 200 other species of uh, cool fish that, uh, that we can uh, eat that are not famous and well-known. You take advantage of the seasons, mm. you know, eat the best fish of each season. So, yeah, for sure. And... and at the end of the day, for me, that's good. The less people know about fish, the more they hire me to tell them about it. So <laughs> I kind of, I kind of exploit that. That's and okay. It's, it's curious because everybody wants to eat fish. Yeah, it, sh it should be something that everybody knows about. Yeah, you know? I, I like um, some of the cool groups around. Like, there's a group in um, in sort of mid to north California. I can't, I can't remember quite what they're called, but they're basically getting in on this and capitalizing on it. They're telling stories about their local fisheries uh it's positively ground fish actually in out of, out of california and so they they they, they go to a local fishing shop and then like a local fisher like a local commercial fisher they go uh -huh. aboard their boat 
They get the people's stories, how they catch their fish, the whole journey from ocean to the restaurants where they, the people send their fish. And they're telling these stories in an upbeat, positive way. The videos sort of go for two to four minutes. And I think that that, that sort of stuff is really increasing the appeal of those fish in their local markets. Like their ground fish have seen a resurgence um, due to good management practices and stuff like that. Our local fisheries need to be telling these stories. Get in like cool little film crews and tell the stories of these these success stories. Like here in Australia, southern bluefin tuna have seen a massive resurgence um, due to some of these um, awesome management strategies and stuff in large part. And, uh, and that's not the only story we've got going. You know, the eastern craze off um, New South Wales and further south, they, they've seen a resurgence. Their bag limits have increased due to, you know, good management practices, possibly some other good things going on in the environment around them that have increased their numbers. I like this. I like hearing stuff like this. I want to hear those stories. You know, they... they, they... Yeah, the more... Sorry. The more people know about the fish, the tastier it gets. And I'll give you an example. So I, I, I was hired by this top restaurant in Rio and they only served uh, uh, grouper, snook and uh, tile fish, which I don't know if you get them over there, but fantastic fish. Really deep And water. these fish are really, ex- yeah. And they're really expensive and they were having a, a tough time making money selling these, these dishes. I went out and uh, brought a bunch of uh, baby barracudas. The, the baby barracuda, the one they have in, in the Mediterranean, it's not the proper great barracuda. Yep. These are, great eating fish and the and the the manager of the restaurant said, said nobody's gonna order this and i said really okay let me come to the table and i said look and when i arrived to the table i said at the end of the summer here in rio it's the schools of baby barracuda arrive it's a short period these are delicious fresh fish caught locally on the islands across the street and we only have them for a few months would you like a baby barracuda? We also have grouper and snook. A hundred percent of the people wanted the baby barracuda. Yeah. If the waiter just showed up and said, oh, we have snook, grouper, and baby barracuda, nobody would touch the baby barracuda. Yeah. We call them bicuda, okay? Bicuda. Nobody would taste, touch the bicuda. Yeah. But if you bring it into context, that's a, and the margin is, for the restaurant owner, a big smile mm-hmm. because- the baby barracudas and when they're all over the place they cost peanuts and everybody you wins know, including the fish and, uh, including the fish exactly mm. exactly so you're absolutely right if you if you tell the story and explain the fish how it was caught why uh, why is it tasty why you, you should take advantage because it's a season or whatever reason mm. everybody wins and the fish tastes better you know the the story makes the fish taste better mm. this is why distributors like have such an important role like you know we see it even in spearfishing retail stores like if you're talking to an engaged salesperson who understands the pros and cons to a bunch of gear and they possibly understand some of the stories that have gone into the gears creation it's much more compelling a purchase you know you've you've bought you haven't bought a product you've bought a story and it has more meaning and you are happier with it there's less buyer's remorse I think the same thing in a seafood restaurant. You know, if someone understands, a waiter understands the story of the locally caught seafood that you're eating, it makes a huge difference. It, it also tells me that we probably underappreciate some of these frontline service people and uh, the good ones are, you know, worth their weight in gold, you know. But, yeah, it's uh, sure. it doesn't really matter what job you do in the world. If you do it well, everyone appreciates it and, and we all reap the benefits of it too. So, yeah, that's cool. Um Oh, good. So, yeah, seafood. restaurant. M- most waiters nowadays are just college students. Yeah, that's true. Well, eh? then they get paid peanuts. It's, it's, you know? it's, it's yeah, it's a, a proper waiter. Uh, I don't know if the waiter's the, the best word, but a waitress, person serve, serving serve a, person, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. It's it, it changed the dining experience, and it's really a unique uh, trait. Mm. And a skillful guy is should be treasured mm. by the restaurant owner and uh, us consumers too. Killfish with precision and power, sending shafts from a stable platform with kill shot spear guns. Made in the Florida Keys by Ed Martin, you're buying American made dependable spear guns. Get $30 off any kill shot spear gun at killshotspearguns.com. Yes and amen, Uber. That's $30 off American made performance spear guns 
at killshotsbeergans.com. It says if they're in the shop or on the phone, they can cash in by saying, Crikey, mate, or the Noob Spiro podcast sent me. Check them out at killshotsbeergans.com, based in the Florida Keys. This podcast is brought to you by aqualite.com.au. This is the best solution, bar none, for staying hydrated in the ocean. If you're a Spiro, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's a game changer. If you're doing extended trips and the cramp starts to set in and uh, the old body's telling you, hey, that's enough, just get hydrated and it will save you a whole heap of woe. It's a groundbreaking product that can help you to stay hydrated. It's got low sugar, it's less acidic than other options on the market, it's rapid absorption, help you to maintain performance. Dehydration of just one to 2% can affect your mental and physical performance by up to six or 7%. And as when you're spearfishing, you can tell when dehydration is starting to affect you because the equalization goes out the window. Get Aqualite at aqualite.com.au. It's scientific rehydration that Spiros know and trust. I know because one works there, and that's why we've set up this discount code for you. 10% off when you use the code NoobSpiro at aqualite.com.au. Check it out. Australian-made hydration products tailored for Spiros and a whole bunch of other people that suffer from dehydration too. But check it out at aqualite.com.au. Use the code NoobSpiro to save 10%. Got a sweet deal for you today, guys. Go to freedivingfamily.com and learn from Adam Stern and a select team of experts on different disciplines. There's Frenzel, Advanced Frenzel, and Hands-Free Equalization, Mouthful, Deep Frenzel Equalization, Bifinning Essentials. These are courses that will give you the 1% that will allow you to improve. Use the code SPIRO to get 20% off any course at freedivingfamily.com. Again, that's the code SPIRO to get 20% off at freedivingfamily.com. Thanks, Adam and team. Love it. Seafood's been a massive thing for you. So I remember reading, you know, like you were talking about how um, serving food, seafood to others is a, is a huge reason why you're passionate about spearfishing. Talk about some of the early meals that, you you know, you prepared that, you know, brought a smile to the, the, the people's faces. Yeah, well, the most important, at least for me, the most important part of seafood and makes people interested in spearfishing. Not only they accept it, oh, they're against it, they feel sorry for the fish, but as soon as their mouth starts watering, they're all for the fish, <laughs> for the spear fishing and the fish. <laughs> so it's 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 a way to convince people. Mm. And uh, going back to the arguments, to fight back the BS, when people complain, you, you can say, whoa, oh, okay, you're against it. So where does your protein come from? Do you have any suggestion of a more sustainable way for me to get my protein? I'll, I'll change. I don't mind. You know, and they don't have an answer. Mm. So first, uh, seafood uh, got me into spearfishing. I want to eat fish. I'm obsessed with eating fish. Second, it, it broadens the audience for spearfishing videos and spearfishing content because you, you make that association with cooking and that helped me make a living. So I work with restaurants. Mm. I have a few fish recipes of mine and uh, oh, yeah. scattered around the world. Let me, yeah. let me, let's ask, let's talk about one. So polenta de testa. Tell me about this. Okay. Oh, that's great. The uh, polenta de testa. Uh, it's, it's, I make, uh, first I boil the head. Testa means head in Italian. Okay. So, I make, uh, I just boil the head and peel off, peel off the flesh. Mm. Okay. And uh, set, save this flesh. I seize that, that water that w- where I boil the head. And then I make a fish, uh, a vegetable broth inside that water. Mm. Okay. With uh, all the v- vegetable broth, uh, uh, celery, garlic, uh, tomato, uh Carrot. potato rosemary vegetable broth carrots carrots important and then i take all the all, all the vegetables out mm. so then i have this big amount of liquid that was where i cooked the fish and it's a fish broth with uh, and then i thicken it with uh, grits mm. which is uh Polenta. like a corn uh, yeah. yeah a corn flour mm. And I, I I put I put back the 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 chunks of fish. Ah. So it becomes so it becomes this really 
chunky, thick, because if you put too much grits, it becomes solid. Mm. So, I mean, you eat it with a spoon, but you can borderline eat it with a fork. That's how thick uh, the broth uh, becomes. Wow. And it's, and, and it's great. It's marvelous. Mm. You know, it's and people love it. And for the fish uh, restaurant owners. Not using the hands. the head. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're going to throw it away. Yeah. A big bowl of that costs peanuts, and you can sell it for a bunch because it's yeah. really expensive. And it's Sometimes tasty. You can, you, no, it's delicious. It's hot. It's 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 the best. Mm. It's the best. But I also have, uh, uh, you know, recipes are just by chance. Once uh, uh, the Brazilian newspaper made an article with me, and they said, okay, Francisco, catch a fish, and then we're going to cook it at, at your house. So my house is okay, but I have this neighbor that has this huge penthouse, beautiful. Mm. So I said, okay, let's let's do it. I call my neighbor. Can I do it in your penthouse? He lives abroad, so he has this amazing house. But just, it's just a butler takes care of it. Mm. So he said, uh, give the butler the ingredients you need, and uh, and uh, show up, and everything's going to be okay. So when I show showed up with the fish, I opened the fridge. The, the fridge was empty. So it's the reporter, the photographer all this stuff ready for me to cook. And I had, had no ingredients. I had uh, in, in, in his fridge, he had garlic, nira, nira, nira you know, the, that green, uh, capsicum, garlic pepper. sprout. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, garlic sprouts. Yep. And it's in Japanese. It's nira, N I R A garlic sprout. Yeah. Okay. Garlic sprout. And the other one is, uh, it's kind of garlic, uh, white, white stem and you chop. Really, uh, like, really like, thin. um, here, we, give me a minute and I'm going to translate this, okay? You yeah, no this. worries. Leek. Leek. Ah, leek. Leek. Ah, leek. leek. Yeah, 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 yeah. Love you, leek. Yeah. So they had these three things. So I figured, you know, it's for a newspaper. Nobody's going to taste this. So as long as it looks good, the recipe is going to work, you know? And I put these three kinds of garlic together, put it in the oven, and it was fantastic. You know, yeah. the just the scent that those three garlics gave out. Mm. So now if you go to Four season in Costa Rica... They have the three garlic snapper, <laughs> <laughs> which I got a big snapper and I, I gave it to them and I show my recipe. So they, they do it uh, like a little closed, uh, wrapped on the on the, on the palm tree thing with mm-hmm. a little fillet of uh, big cubera with these three garlics on top, olive oil, and it's fantastic. Mm-hmm. So that w- that recipe was just by chance. The previous one, the polenta di testa, I, I worked on it. I tried grits. I tried yucca flour. I've been perfecting it over the years. Mm. In my Facebook, there's a bunch of recipes like that. Mm. And just olive oil, close it, the scent that it blows out, the, the neighbors will be ringing your doorbell. And <laughs> that one was just by chance. So you can do it yourself or you can go to the Four Seasons restaurant in Costa Rica, Papagayo, and mm. overpay for it. You know. <laughs> and the first time I did it was with mackerel, actually. Ooh. So it works with mackerel. Of course, mm. other fish too. I just quickly read up. It said here, fish bones, brains, and cartilage are fat. And nutritious, containing high levels of vitamin A, omega three fatty acids, iron, zinc, and calcium, and uh, so and it's an underutilized piece of fish. So I think if we can get uh, people eating it, then you know that's awesome. Yeah, when I do the the fish broth, the first part, I put the head, but I also put the carcass. Mm. So everything, you know, with with the uh, scales. And actually, I have a funny story because uh, once I spent uh, New Year's Eve in, uh, in the Caribbean. And Eleuthera, my favorite island in the Bahamas, with my family. I had my Italian cousins. We rented three houses. And I was supposed to spearfish and catch all the food for everybody. And at the, you know, the Christmas uh, Christmas day, I hadn't fished. The weather wasn't good. So I went to the market late afternoon. Mm. And all the fish were sold. And sitting on the, on the ground were three grouper heads being licked by dogs. Mm. I kicked the dogs out. I brought those three grouper heads home. And I did this too. And I mean, my cousins are going, no way, I'm eating that. The dog was licking it. But a few hours later, people couldn't have enough. You know? <laughs> Let's talk about um, one of your favorite species to hunt and yeah. how you do it effectively. Well, my, I don't, I don't know if I have a favorite species. Maybe the, the, the Mediterranean grouper, Epinephalus marginatus, is my favorite. It's just because it's what I used to do for a living, shooting these groupers. They're really challenging. They usually are in holes. So it's with the flashlight. There's a proper technique to sneak up on them on the holes. But, you know, not only for these groupers, but in spear fishing in general, shooting the fish is easy. The real challenge is to find them. So when you wake up in the morning and you get on your boat, 
you have a bunch of options on where to go. The real real master is is really finding out from all these spots you can go where the fish are concentrated. You know, fish are not spread out even on an island. I would say that they're eighty percent in one or two spots, and all the rest of uh, you know all the rest of the island has nothing. So that's the real skill. Anybody that lands on the the fishy pinnacle or the fishy bay or whatever is going to whack fish. So it's really determining. So the groupers also like that. So today, you know, where are the groupers? And then at what depth? I mean, you can shoot huge groupers really shallow and when the conditions are right. So it's not about diving deep. Approach, never uh, approach the cave head first. Come from the side and have a peak. But have a peak with your gun already. At the second moment, you use the flashlight. At first, uh, don't use the flashlight. If you can watch it, if you can see the grouper without the flashlight, better for you. Once you turn the flashlight on, you, you usually have a second uh. before it gets spooked and run away. And when, you, when you're when you clearing, let's say, the cave with the flashlight, move your gun with the flashlight. Because uh. once you put the light on a fish, you have a second to shoot. So it's not, not look and then move your gun. So it's, it's, it's a fish that kills a lot of people. In France, they call it the Poisson assassin, the killer fish, because no fish has killed uh, more free di- spear fishermen than the Mediterranean groupers. They and uh, and and ruin their free dive. They do effort. It's gonna run to the cave. It's gonna run to the next cave. Take your time. Come back two three hours later. If you do land a bad shot and it rocks up, you should ha- always have a gaff for mm-hmm. this kind of fishing. But also you can you can uh, tie a float to the grouper and then just leave it for a couple of hours. You know. Uh, your your uh, the other Isaac <laughs> will help you. Isaac Newton, the <laughs> gravity. You know, <laughs> if, if you leave the tension, a moment the grouper will relax, mm. and uh, the other Isaac will pull it out of the cave for you. Ah. So don't don't put too much effort physically underwater. You can get a gaff, pull it with the gaff. If not, put a float line on the spear and let the, the Isaac Newton uh, do the job for you. <laughs> but it's it's my favorite uh, prime fish. One issue we have here is is it like if you shoot a fish in a cave uh, or it caves up on you after you shoot it, um, sometimes it invites sharks to come in because they, they are attracted to all the movement, you know, a fish in distress. Um, do you guys have issues with that there in Rio? Um, I've seen some of your videos with bull sharks. I'm just not sure what the sharks are like around Rio. No, yeah, they're not, none of them are, are in Brazil. It's it's not an issue. I fish with a stringer in my waist. I love having that heavy stringer. I love it. You know, it's even with a bunch of small fish, I get happy with that full stringer. <laughs> and it's not an issue. But when you're diving in a sharky spot, you got to take that into consideration. So, like I said, don't give miracle shots on big fish. If 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 you're diving in a sharky spot, don't give shots to a fish that you know you won't be able to retrieve it immediately, or else you're just going to lose your gear once. The shark tastes the flesh. They get even more dangerous. So take that into consideration. The same way you take into the consideration a current if you're diving deep. You know, you can't land a, give a deep dive and rock up a fish in the current because they're probably going to die trying to catch it or the fish is going to die. You're not going to retrieve it. So it's just one more element for you to consider when uh, when pulling the trigger. Love it. Mate, I love that. The, your groper technique sounds really interesting. Um so you're you're diving down. You're not approaching head first. You you want to approach from the side or the or, and and I guess you're giving that whole the groper a minimum profile to see. So you and then you're using your the best vision you have before you turn on your torch, exactly. so you're not spooking them. And then you give us some tips there about um, if they are difficult to retrieve from the hole, particularly in deep diving where you risk a squeeze and things like that. Um, using either gravity or 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 a gaff to try and retrieve that fish from the hole. Exactly, exactly. It's 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 a dangerous fish, but very very satisfying. And yeah. It's a fish that you find in Rio in the Mediterranean, but it's not all, not all over the world. Love it, man. Thank you very much. Um, toughest situation. It's uh, toughest. The question in your in your guide is uh, toughest situation in the water. Yeah. The, the times that I thought I was closer to dying was actually surfing. I like to surf big waves, so <laughs> I get I, I had more close calls with uh, big waves than actual spear fishing. Wow! But tough moments is when people black out for sure. Uh, I had a yeah, I had a few incidents with that. I had I've had uh, close calls with uh, boats when I wasn't diving with the float, which is stupid, my fault. More often that than actually n- negligence from the boat guy. It was, it's more me doing the, being at the wrong place with the the wrong gear. 
I've been I've been also going out with small boats in the middle of the ocean, which is really hazardous. A lot of things could have gone wrong. Luckily, they didn't. And these are all stuff that I don't do anymore now that I'm a parent. But I used to do plenty of unwise things. Um, I'm I'm stoked that <laughs> fatherhood's uh, um, changed some of your ideas, and you and you're still here with us. So, two spear fishing legends that were my friends died at 50 years old. Super world champions and uh, incredible free divers. And I mean, if it can happen to them, it can happen to me. So, and not because I'm 50 years old and experienced and uh, have seen all this stuff that I'm I'm still I'm still at risk. So I'm I'm really cautious. Um, Francisco, you seem like a really fun guy too. Um, despite our internet troubles, <laughs> you've been a real good sport. Um, guys with your kind of <laughs> kind of attitude, I think generally other people like to go spearfishing with you because you have a good time. So I'd imagine you've uh, had some funny experiences out spearfishing. <laughs> yeah, well, everybody has a hard time when we bring that question. But I have a, a fun story. It's not back in my commercial days. Mm. It's not actually in the water. But we used to sell fish to this uh, fancy restaurant in Rio. Okay. And their freezer was on the third floor on this uh, really tight spiral ladder. Mm. So we would uh, arrive in the restaurant, would neg- negotiate the price with this guy that was really cheap, the owner of the restaurant. And then we would have to carry uh, the fish up two, two flights of stairs in a really steep uh, circular spiral ladder uh, staircase. Okay. And once we got up there, that's where the, the scale and his freezer were. And I mean, every time we got up there, he would say, okay. And he would just start trying to pay less than we had agreed. He would, he would say, okay, I'll, I'll pay $12 a kilo. And then once we got up there, he's like, oh, I can only pay nine. Oh, my freeze. I just realized my freezer's full of grouper. I can only pay nine. <laughs> and then we'd get pissed off, but we're all there and, and we'll let, let him have the fish. Well, this, <laughs> this, this one time we went up with me and my friend, I was, I was young and my friend more experienced and less, uh, less, uh, friendly than me so we went up the stairs when we got up there he said oh man i can't pay 12 on these big groupers i can only pay nine and then my friend said oh fuck it i'm not i'm not gonna sell the fish let's take it down again and i'm like oh don't worry man just let's get rid of the fish it's late i'm tired and my friend no way i'm not selling it for 12 let's leave and he started putting the fish the groupers back in the box so we can back in the cooler help me take it down and like no man just just sell the fish just (laughs) let's get rid of it we don't come here next time nine is good enough and my friend's like no 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 and i'm saying there's no need to have all this pride man just whatever he's he's a loser and he's like no let's get out of here so we we eventually took the fish down the stairs the only time i did that in my life once we got back on the pickup he opened the cooler and there were two bottles of champagne down the throat of each of each grouper so when the guy started uh, complaining about the price my friend just shoved two bottles of uh, of champagne down the group the champagne from the from the restaurant down the grouper's belly and uh, we walked away <laughs> with the uh, champagne <laughs> so don't get angry get even you know yeah. don't get angry <laughs> have you got issues with your eq game Let's just do a quick little exercise. Put one hand on your chest and do an equalize. Just do it right now. Did your chest move when you equalized? If it did, bad news friend, you are using Valsalva. You need to go to Ted Hardy's Roadmap to Frenzel course and learn how to frenzel. Now, quite often if you've come from a scuba background, you will be using Valsalva. This is what you're taught. And uh, when you've got a tank on your back, it's pretty effective. But when you are head down, bum up in the world of free dive spearfishing you need to learn frenzel technique it will get you down and past 30 foot and equalizing with ease to learn this frenzel technique go to noobspearo.com forward slash ted check out the roadmap to frenzel class he will get you frenzel equalizing within a matter of days check it out it's a simple easy to follow course noobspearo.com forward slash ted jeremy gamble from spearing magazine the world's greatest spearfishing publication says anytime i hear anyone complaining about the ears i always say the same thing talk to ted he's known throughout the industry as the guy that can fix people's struggling with clearing issues there's no one out there that knows more about equalizing and teaching people to equalize than ted check it out again at noobspearo.com forward slash ted So dive gear, like yeah, I mean, you've traveled broadly as well. Um, what you you sort of talked about Rio there, like you get a really um, difference in in uh, ocean temp based on which current you're you're dealing with. What what's your sort of 
day-to-day dive gear, what wetsuits do you need in Rio? No, Rio's usually three and a half mil. Okay. And the guns, spear guns I most use is 100 or 110 with the single, with the single, with the single band. Okay. With the single band. If the water's really clear, I'll go with the 120 and two bands. Okay. But with that six and a half shaft, one band in a hundred gun or a 110 gun, I mean, both sides, I don't miss a shot. I really can be really precise and that helps me a lot. So again, uh, and one of the questions in your your guide, I mean, what's your particular thing in spearfishing? Your little, uh, I, I use small guns. I use a small float. Uh, you saw the video, I, I believe, of me shooting. Yeah, big, I did. And then you, I was using a float the size of a football. Yeah, it's the same float I. I did. <laughs> the float passes right by me. You know. Yeah, yeah. So I use light gear. Okay. I, I don't believe in huge floats, huge bungee line. Uh, you know, big guns, and it and it works out. the The big uh, fish trophy video that you saw, I shot it with the float, the size. I shot the winning fish with with the float, the size of a football. And mm. even the marlin I shot in that competition, I was using that same float. Wow! And, and again, that pushes me to give a good solid shot, not to try crazy miracle shots, mm. you know, or belly shots. I could never land neither of these fish if I had given them a belly shot instead of a solid head shot. Mm. Man, I, I think it works for you. A lot like, of times I spear fish without a reel and without a float, you know, and yeah, it works. <laughs> so you're you're sponsored by Cressy. I'd love to hear a rundown on, you know, what wetsuits you're, you're running. My very first wetsuit was a Cressy. I can't remember what type of Cressy suit it was. It was a three mil and it was beautiful. And, it, and it, I, I think I wore it for four or five years. Like it was a very tough suit. And so I have, I have some fond uh, association with the Cressy brand. Um, but walk us through sort of um, what you're really digging yeah, about, here. about you know, there. My, I'll, I'll tell you a story. You know, we're, we were working on developing this new gun uh, for Cressy, and there was kind of a pressure to get the gun out for, for summer, you know, for European summer. And we're testing and improving, testing and improving. And again, there was this pressure to get the gun out for summer. And Mr. Cressy said, take your time. There will be other summers, mm. you know. Cressy is a family-owned company and it has the owner's name on it. They take pride and they want everything to be perfect. If Cressy was owned by a corporation and had a bunch of executives that needed a bonus at the end of the year, they would have launched the gun the way it was and not missed the summer. Mm. So being privately owned, it reflects in the quality of the products. And Pure Fishing Heroes are Italian. I grew up with the Spirit and the Cressy Champions. So it always has been my favorite brand. So when they invited me to be part of the Cressy team, it was like the happiest day of my life. Mm-hmm. Flying to, to Genova, uh, meeting Mr. Cressy and having lunch with him. Oh, my God. It was a dream come true, pinching myself. And this was uh, many years ago. And mm-hmm. it's now it's it's a great – you have great support. There are Cressy dealers and Cressy teammates all over the world. Yeah. So anywhere in the world that I, that I am, I can – there's a Cressy person that I can call and say, help me out, figure out the fish or – I I tore my wetsuit. I was last week, I was, I was competing in Mallorca and I took a five mil and it was like, the it snowed in Mallorca. It was the coldest winter in decades. Mm. I called the Cressy people in the afternoon. Next day in the morning, there was a box full of Cressy gear at my door at the hotel. <laughs> That's I good. didn't even see who brought it. You know, it's <laughs> just, I had a seven mil wetsuit, five mil gloves, five mil fin, the, the new fins. They gave me stiffer fins so I could dive heavier with the thicker wetsuit and thinker so it's it's a dream come true for any spear fisherman to join the cressy team and i mean i can't say that everything cressy does is the best in world but wetsuit rail guns fins they're the best mm. even if if i were to go to a shop and buy here it's what i would buy mm-hmm. you know maybe they can improve their floats for bigger fish okay but small de- and and they make amazing travel bags people underappreciate the travel bags for not only dive gear, but they have a huge line of uh, travel bags and they're great. Yeah. So love it. I'm, I'm, I'm happy at Cressy. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Mate, Francisco, I, I love it. Um, what is, there's a couple of other brands you have stuff to do with like that are mainly uh, Brazilian. I don't know how far beyond Brazil some of their stuff get, but um, just talk quickly about some of the other um, equipment companies that you um, have, have dealings with. Well, uh, there's good gear made in Brazil, especially spear guns. And there are about 40,000 spear guns manufactured in Brazil a year. Wow. Between the three manufacturers. So it's a lot of spear guns. 
that's a lot of people spearfishing. There's uh, one brand called Divecom, Divecom C O M, yep. and they make fantastic guns. It's the, the guns I used before joining Cressy and uh, solid, unbreakable. They would be the Brazilian version of Rob Allen, which okay. also is, has great gear, you know, flashy stuff and all these new technologies. At the end of the day, the basic stuff works. So that's that's where Rob Allen and Divecom really shine. Simple, tough gear, works well, will land you the fish. So uh, this Brazilian uh, company, Divecom. And, be- and besides that, the owner loves spearfishing competition. He, sp- he sponsors every single spearfishing competition in Brazil. And it's 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 tricky for a dive company to spear to sp- sponsor a dive competition because your competitor's diver might win, you know? So a lot of dive companies don't want to sp- sponsor competition that his rival can win, you know? And uh, Dilson from Cressy, he, so Dilson from Divecom, he doesn't care. He, he like, loves the sport. He knows competitions are important, so he sponsors them. So a big uh, shout out, and, and I, I clap my hands to Divecom and uh, Dilson, uh, the owner, owner and founder. Yeah, cool. Let's um, let let's wrap this show up with an awesome faster paced round of questions, Francisco. I think you're familiar with this. It's uh, the Spiro Q and A. You ready to go? Hit me. <laughs> yeah, hit me. What is the single best piece of advice you have ever been given for spearfishing? <laughs> Uh, I used to take pride when I was a kid in the beginning, never to miss a shot. So I was, I was diving with him with one of my professors, uh, mentors. And he said, Oh, I, I missed the shot. And I, you know, cocky said, well, I never miss a shot. And he goes, then you're probably missing out a lot of fish that you could land. So in that, the, after that advice on small fish, not on big fish, but on small fish, I started taking difficult shots, fish swimming away, fish uh, that needed a wrist shot or from the hip shot. And by taking these difficult shots and missing a bunch, I perfected my skill, and now I can land these difficult shots. So a bunch of fish that I would not shoot back in the day, now I can not only shoot, but land the shot. So with small fish, uh, rainbow runners and different kind of jacks and uh, these, these small species of mackerels and stuff, take these crazy difficult shots, and eventually you're going to start landing them. And then you're going to be more skilled to land difficult shots or precise shots. Mm. This was really important. And at the end of the day, my only true skill in spearfishing is being a sharp shooter. All the trophies and all the stuff, cool fish I landed because I have a precise shot. Mm. So it, it did me well. It's a skill that any beginner can uh, work on and uh, it will pay off. Perfect. Who has been the most influential person or people in your spearfishing? There are two. I had two or three mentors uh, going, going from zero to something was uh, JP or, or, or uh, American George is a, a Swiss diver that lives in Rio. So he, he got me from the beginner to a guy that could land fish. The, the example I told you about uh, taking risky shots, I learned from him. But then I went uh, diving with another guy called uh, Musu Palma, which was like a European diver. He used no gloves and dove with the Rolex. <laughs> and he knew all the international guys and competed. So he really got me fascinated in, into competing and being amongst the, uh, the best people in the world. So these two guys influenced me a lot. The third would be a guy called Tata Leitão, which is the best group of diver competitor in the 80s and 90s. So competition hacks I, I got from him, Tata Leitão. Wow. All three of them are legends here in Brazil. And I was fortunate uh, to dive with them. For, for people that don't have a, an, an in-person mentor, yeah. what's been what what's the single best resource for uh, uh, improving you know your spearfishing if if you don't have an in-person mentor think it over when you get home what did i do right what did i do wrong if you can dive with a camera and review your dives i do that a lot all the time so you can prove on your own and there's a lot of information on the internet so before there were like two three books and uh, now everything's out there so do your research listen to more experienced people uh, once you land start landing cool fish you still suck and you still have a lot to improve. You know, it's easy to think, oh, now I'm a good spear fisherman. You know, and basically, and especially go compete. Nothing makes you improve faster than competing. Being with more or surrounded by skills, divers with better skills, and diving all day in a competition, coming back with three fish and some other dude has 20 fish and figuring out what did he do right, what did you do wrong. So I recommend, I recommend people to go and compete. That will make you improve a lot. And uh, research and don't get cocky. You're still not good. Okay, you shot, you landed this amazing fish. You're still a beginner. You still suck, and uh, still work hard to to improve. <laughs> That's really good advice, man. I love that. And um, as you were saying before, like being humble, like it it, it um 
it makes a massive difference um how you get along with the with the people you meet and dive with like uh there's always something to learn there's always a new technique um so it's really cool well that brought, brought me brought to mind some good about what your comment just brought to mind here uh some good advice you know be aware of the people you're diving with i have a magic sentence that opens door or doors every time i travel to a new place and i can share with everybody this makes all the difference every time you were going to dive abroad with the local fishermen and stuff and they don't want to share this is my magic sentence i don't own, own a gps and you can keep my fish and then <laughs> all doors open a big smile and people share <laughs> their, their spots with you <laughs> so and it's true i do not own a gps and uh and oh you're asking about something stupid uh, earlier you know i used to travel to remote places and try to sell the fish mm. and that i mean that just backfires i've I've had people shoot my spear gun at me on land. Wow. Local guys. I've had to run for my life a couple of times, you know, for being cocky and trying to sell fish that I caught at some somebody's backyard. You know, you don't travel to do that. Mm. You don't travel to do that. So that's possibly a stupid thing to do and the most stupid thing I've done in my <laughs> 20s. I haven't done that in a while. I love so, your honesty, man. Uh, uh, you know, it, it takes a big person my magic to sentence. admit their mistake. Yeah. I don't own a GPS. You can keep my fish. <laughs> this time I ran for my life. Yeah. I was in the Caribbean. I found this new pinnacle. I shot a bunch of fish and everybody was upset and I was cocky. And I told them, look, God creates the fish and I kill the fish. <laughs> and then when I said that to the, the natives, I mean, everybody was against me. <laughs> so... I figured I should figure out a better sentence to, to say when I'm traveling. That was pretty stupid. I love it. It's a good one. I I don't own a GPS and, and you know, you can keep my fish. It's a, it sounds like a sentence that will open some doors. That's very cool. Um, was there anything else we missed out on discussing Francisco? <laughs> well, I, I, in my notes here, I have, well, some, some advice for beginners. The first one is, you know, people that black out and die or black out, people that black out and black out and die that, doesn't happen out of the blue. People build up to that, you know? So are you building up to a blackout? Is it something that's bound to happen to you? If it is, rethink, you know, uh, today a lot of people think uh, blacking out is part, part of the sport and it's eventually going to happen. And that's not true. I've never blacked out and I've always been cautious. It's actually an advice I gave to Valentine Thomas when she said, oh, you know, I feel that I'm going to black out at any moment or, or, you know, she made a comment. I can't remember her exact words but it was like it's it's bound to happen at any moment and i told her no it's not bound to happen and you shouldn't expect it it's if if you're building up to a blackout you're doing something wrong mm -hmm. you can have a perfect spear fishing career dive all your life you know take chances once in a while and never black out mm -hmm. so it doesn't happen out of the blue think to yourself are you building up to blackout and are you building up to blackout and die excellent if yes rethink it it's blacking out it's not normal and it's not part of the sport it's not something that just happens out of the blue. It's great advice. So that's one advice. The other one is take crazy shots on small fish. As you mentioned. From your not mentor. on big fish. Yeah. That's cool. And okay. another one, if you're a beginner and uh, even advanced, <laughs> people like Cressy will be maybe upset at me, but don't use a dive watch. A dive watch doesn't help you. A dive watch gives you bad advice. For a person like me, very experienced that knows my body well, I'm happy with the dive watch. But for most people, it will give you bad advice. Okay. elaborate on that francisco here's mm. uh bad advice let's say i'm i'm a guy that's comfortable diving at 20 meters okay but not every day i'm good at 20 meters there'll be days that i'm perfectly five fine at 25 and there will be days that 10 12 is deep uh i had a fight with my wife the dog peed in the carpet i had a flat tire and that day i can only dive 15 meters mm. so i know that my, i'm comfortable at 20 but th the day that i'm can only dive 15. When I reach 15, the, the my dive watch is going to say, hey, Francisco, it's only 15. You can go five more meters. You've been at 20 meters, and it's fine. And that day, I'm not. And it's going to push me to go not to listen to my body that's telling me 15 is your limit today. And it's the watch is going to make me think I can dive diver than I dive deeper than I actually can. Mm. And and there's also the reverse uh, bad advice. You know, I'm I'm good at 20. I'm fine at 20, but there is this one day that I can go at 30 meters. Mm. And if I go deeper than, than I'm used to, and I look at my watch and it says 30 meters, that's going to give me adrenaline and mm. say, damn, Francisco, you're deeper than you've ever been before 
and and that's going to ruin my diet. Mm. And and it's going to give you bad advice. It's going to say it's too deep for you mm. when that day it's not too deep and put me at risk. The same way a day that it's going to say, hey, Francisco, this is shallow. You can go deeper. And your body actually tells you you cannot. And that also uh, happens on surface intervals. Oh, I always take a two-minute uh, surface interval. There are days that two minutes are not enough. And if you're using the watch to decide if you had enough surface interval or not, you're not listening to your body. There are moments, there are days that a minute is good enough, and there are days that five minutes is not, not good enough. And your watch is just going to tell you two minutes, you can dive now. You know, and that's bad advice on, on both ways. Francisco, mate, um, just fantastic advice. I, I could chat with you all day. I um I've got another interview booked in a couple of minutes, and um I I want to I want to continue this conversation, <laughs> and so I want to tell you like you're you're always welcome to come back on the Noob Spirit podcast. Like um I feel like we didn't even scratch the surface, buddy. Um I know you've got your own uh, podcast, uh, so please tell people where people can find that. Um, I'm going to link everything up in today's show notes. So if people go to noobspiro.com forward slash Francisco. Um, I'll have um, your Insta- Instagram, which is Francisco Lafredi, your YouTube, um, Facebook, and uh, anything else you want to link up, we can do that. Also, all Francisco in there. Lafredi. Perfect. Okay. Well, yeah, it helps me a lot. Before to live from spearfishing, you need to shoot fish. Now you need followers and online presence. <laughs> so please help an old Spiro <laughs> make a living spearfishing by following me on Instagram and signing my YouTube channel and, and that stuff. For the Portuguese speaking people, Assistam no meu podcast Sangue no Convés. Você pode achar no Spotify, em qualquer lugar. Faz um Google Sangue no Convés e vão ter os episódios lá. I just told people in Portuguese to look up my, my, my uh, podcast called Blood on Deck, Sangue no Convés. It's all in Portuguese, but it's lots of fun. And people enjoy it. So if you speak Portuguese, you're going to enjoy it too. And it truly has been an honor. Uh, and I look forward to uh, uh, being featured again. Yeah, man. It's been awesome. I, unfortunately, we were plagued with... A little bit of poor internet at the back end of this um, chat, so I'm a little bit um, like I would lo- I'd, I would love to have to have had perfect internet for the whole thing, but you know that's life sometimes. Man, as I said, you're welcome back here any time, and uh, obrigado. That's probably the only um, Portuguese I know, but uh, mate, um, it's been an absolute pleasure. You're a real gentleman, and uh, I hope people do come and come and follow you. It was a pleasure. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed Francisco and stuck through uh, the, the back end of that conversation. Um, believe it or not, my legendary, uh, one of my le- legendary audio guys, Pat, has probably sewn this up and turned it into something beautiful, as he always does. But we had a bunch of internet issues there at the back end, so thanks for sticking around and listening to everything that Francisco had to say. He's an absolute gentleman. Go and follow him on the socials and YouTube and all, all the other jam and good stuff. Um, next week, Pressure Project with Adam Sellers. We talk all about being a freediving and spearfishing instructor and how to teach more relaxed students. If you want to take people freediving or spearfishing, I reckon you'll get something out of this. So come and join. Come and join us. Adam, he's uh, he is the man behind the Pressure Project. Very cool dude and, uh, and my friend and mentor. So come back and uh, I'll see you next week. If you love the show, jump on patreon.com forward slash Noob Sparrow. Consider becoming a patron legend like 47 others powering the Noob Sparrow podcast and putting fuel in the outboard. Boom, we're done. Today's episode was an absolute banger and so is our major sponsor, Adreno. Visit them at adreno.com.au. They have a huge range of equipment. You can find it at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear at checkout. When you shop online, you can save $20 on every purchase over $200. You can even use that code in store at some of their huge mega stores Australia wide. Price beat guarantee on any Australian spearfishing equipment price. Again, visit them at adreno.com.au. Use the code NoobSpear. I don't know if I'm allowed to say it, but oorah! When I say the words neptonics.com, I automatically want to say it. It is solid gear that works. It's the very best of spearing equipment and components from around the planet. Visit neptonics.com. It's solid gear that works. Visit neptonics.com. Use the code NOOB10 to save 10% off.